This is a very simplified version of a modern cooling system. We've got an engine here running, generating heat, and that heat has to go somewhere. Some of it is going to head out the exhaust, but that's not going to get rid of enough heat for this engine to stay as cool as it needs to be. Now heat is in part good for the engine. A engine runs better at a higher temperature. Sometimes that's about 180 degrees for the coolant. Sometimes that's 210. It's going to differ from engine to engine, but there are some benefits to having heat, but you don't want it to run away and have like 240 degrees, 280 degrees. You're going to have all kinds of problems then, so we need to get rid of that heat somehow. I've got the green marker in my hand because it's going to be coolant. A lot of people generally assume coolant is green. A lot of coolant is. So we've got this whole area filled in with coolant. Coolant. And this coolant can move, flow around. There's a water pump here that can move the coolant around. Heat needs to go somewhere, so it's going to rise to the top. And sometimes there will be a bypass hose that will lead to the water pump, so it can churn that up. And while everything is in a sealed system right here, you generally want to get all this coolant about the same temperature. As this gradually heats up, some heat is going to make its way to the thermostat. The thermostat is very mechanical in that there isn't a whole lot of electronic stuff going on there. Modern cars do have some electronics as I've drawn here, and I'll get to that in a minute, but for older vehicles and even newer vehicles, this is going to have a little wax pellet inside of it that will expand and contract with the heat that comes by it. And this needs to be submerged in coolant. There's a little brass piece here. Brass is a good conductor of heat. Coolant is a good conductor. Air is not. So coolant gets up here and as this warms up, if it gets to a high enough temperature, it will expand and let coolant through. Then it's gradually going to make its way to this area. And this that I've drawn is the radiator. This is out in front of your car. Most modern radiators are aluminum. There are copper radiators out there, but with the price of copper going up nowadays, it's really rare to find one of those and they'd be super expensive. And the properties that you get from copper are better, but not enough to justify the price anymore. So aluminum conducts heat pretty decently. So air is going to be flowing through a bunch of veins on this aluminum radiator. The veins are like a zigzag piece of metal. There's a whole bunch of those from top to bottom or side to side, depending on how the manufacturer built that radiator. But the point is that it's going to have a lot of surface area. The air passes by that surface area and the heat can get from the radiator to the air. Air going past this radiator is constantly cooling the radiator down because it's taking the heat with it. And as it goes, the coolant is gonna to continue to pass through here, partially because of flow, but also as things cool down, they sink and it's going down through the radiator as it's cooling. So two factors going into play to help it flow in the direction that it needs to. Then it continues from the radiator hose and goes back into the engine. That creates a process of the heat gets generated here, sent to the radiator, cooled down, the heat is transferred to the air, and then the cool fluid comes back and it can take more heat away. Now with all this happening, you realize it's cold outside and you want to warm up. So this is going to also be able to be used to warm us up. It's going to go through this heater core, which is in the cabin. Your blower motor will blow air past it. The air will take the heat from this coolant as it passes through it and send it to your cabin area. Then the cooled down fluid passes back through this lower hose. The hot side of the heater hose would actually come from the water pump, but I ran out of space to draw that, so I drew it backwards. But the same idea is there. This is just a simplified heater control valve, which is just a valve that will, in this drawing, just shut off the flow or open up and allow flow to happen. And that controls whether or not you get heat here. But what about this electric plug that I drew here for the thermostat? Well, even in this modern car, it's still controlled by a wax pellet thermostat. You can still send electricity here, to heat up that wax pellet and cause this to open whenever you want. Not necessarily whenever you want, but whenever the engine control computer decides it's a good time to open it up. You can open this up prematurely to let coolant flow if you think this engine is doing something that is going to need coolant soon and this is not going to open up fast enough, so I'm going to send power to open it up even sooner. Earlier I mentioned that engines run a little better with some heat in them. Why is that? 
Well, one of the things that you want from your cylinder walls is for there to be a little bit of oil there. So as your piston is going in and out of that and the piston rings are against the wall, there's going to be minimal friction. The air fuel ratio is going to come into the cylinder area and the fuel is going to want to condense on the cold cylinder walls. And when the fuel hits those cold cylinder walls, it's gonna wash all that oil off and you're gonna have no oil there to help with the lubrication and prevent some friction from happening. That is not something you want. So you want this engine to heat up as quickly as possible until it gets to where you want it. So as I alluded to before, a lot of older engines will still have a bypass pipe where all this hot up top coolant will be drawn in by the water pump, be sent down and can mix in with the bottom coolant, which is cooler. And that is a very common setup on some engines. But on some newer engines, you will have a hot coolant reservoir, which is an insulated container. It's kind of like those canteens where you're actually holding a cylinder, but the cylinder that holds the liquid that you're about to drink is inside that, not touching what you're actually holding. So you can hold it, it doesn't feel super cold, but the liquid inside can be super cold. And it's got an insulation barrier, probably just air. Like this, here's in purple, the insulation barrier and the liquid will actually be stored inside of here and as long as you start the car back up within a certain amount of time maybe let's say 48 hours that liquid is still hot from all that time with that stored there once you start the engine up the water pump starts going pushes the cold fluid through here pushes the hot fluid back out of here you instantly have some heat already in the engine getting it going to where it needs to be even if you don't care about the engine benefits of that your heater core is going to get warm faster and that means on a winter day when it's freezing outside you're going to get warm faster too. Now not quite as new as these electric plug thermostats are these two stage thermostats and I'm not meaning to separate the two you can still have an electric plug based thermostat that has the two stages to it but this is a different design you can see it's similar to this but this just has this one spring area there's a spring here that's there but this is new so this allows an opening and this allows a smaller opening. And these are gonna open up at two different temperatures. What the idea is here is that if you have an aluminum block, which is more susceptible to thermal shock, where if coolant comes in and it's too cold, it can cause it to crack. The main idea is that a little outlet will let some flow through and as the temperature is rising and you're trying to get some coolant through, before the big temperature spike hits and then you get a lot of coolant through, you're already making some coolant get cooled down. So it's not a big shock to the system when a bunch of coolant comes through and it's really cold from this radiator. And that's relative because the temperature that it's coming here at maybe 210 degrees, is not gonna be coming back here at something where you can feel like you can touch it. It's still gonna be super hot to you, but Relatively speaking, it's cold to the engine. Alternative to this, you can actually have a car that has two thermostats in it. These are common temperature ranges for thermostats. They're not all going to fit into those three categories. Um, some of the OE style thermostats will be a little more exact than that. A lot of aftermarket ones may be like 195, but you actually need a 197. It's pretty close, but ideally you want what the factory designed the car to run at, because if you have a 210 thermostat, and it opens at like 195 or 180, the engine's gonna run much cooler than the ECU wants it to, and you're gonna throw some trouble codes, and you probably won't pass emissions. If you're buying a thermostat for your car, and it says use a 195, and you're going, oh, I live in Florida or Texas, or somewhere where it's really hot all the time, and I don't need to have that high temperature thermostat, I'm gonna put in something cooler so my engine can run cooler, it's gonna run at that temperature. It's gonna open up sooner, but it's, it's gonna open up. The 180 isn't like a bigger mouth to it that causes more flow or anything. It's the same design, it just opens at a different temperature. You're not getting any benefits from running a cooler one unless you've modified your car and it can take a lower temperature and it's happy with that and you're still probably not gonna meet emissions and that's just for race cars and stuff like that. If you're getting a thermostat for your daily driver, don't mess around with the temperature, just get the temperature that it's supposed to have. Make sure you get the right coolant for your vehicle too. All of these components are made out of different materials sometimes, like this fan here might be made out of plastic and you've got a aluminum radiator, it might have a coating on the inside of some sort. Same with the heater core, your hoses are made out of rubber and there might be different kinds of rubber that they use. The thermostat on a lot of modern cars is part of a plastic housing that 
If the thermostat goes bad, you have to replace the whole housing, including that electric plug setup it's got. If you put the wrong coolant in there, it might cause that to warp or melt, and you really don't want to be dealing with that, especially on a new car. Putting in the wrong coolant could void your warranty. Sometimes even manufacturers don't get it right. You may recall a particular orange coolant that wasn't working well with some engines that the manufacturer made. If you switch to a different coolant and you ran into a problem with it sludging up, then you probably didn't have much of a leg to stand on. But if you use the original coolant that was causing the problem, the manufacturer is at fault there and they're going to have to warranty that out. Also, coolant tanks have changed over the years. This is the traditional radiator cap design where this is the radiator and at the top there's a cap. What happens here is there's a seal here and pressure builds up in the system. As things heat up, they expand and if they have nowhere to expand, they build up pressure instead. That pressure pushes on this spring on a rod that holds the seal down. Once the cooling system reaches the pressure that this radiator cap is rated for, a lot of times it's 16 PSI, but it can differ, it pushes up on this seal here and it overcomes the force of the spring, allowing the coolant to escape through this vent here. And then it goes through a hose to the bottom of an overflow tank and then it fills up with liquid. It's already got some liquid in there and it can take however much it's designed to take. And as the system cools down after you shut the car off and it's parked for the day, everything cools down and atmospheric pressure in this tank is actually higher than the coolant system pressure and it will push the coolant back through this tube past the seal and refill the cooling system. This area here is typically the highest point of the pressurized side of the cooling system because you want to get rid of any air that you have. Air that's in the system is going to float to the top and if it's in the radiator the top is right here so as soon as this opens and stuff starts escaping any air bubbles in the system are probably going to be pushed out and sent to this tank and in the tank they'll just float up to the top here and then mingle with the rest of the air here and then when coolant is drawn back in it'll draw in coolant and not air. Well, it'll draw in coolant until there's nothing left to draw in but air. So you want to keep that topped off a little bit with coolant. It'll generally have a marker on it where you want to keep the level at. There's also a cap on here, but it's not pressurized. It's usually just a little flimsy plastic cap that's attached to a tether. That cap will often also have a hole in it. Another design you'll see is the expansion tank, named because it expands the pressurized side of the system. Instead of there being a radiator cap on the radiator, you have an expansion tank cap on the expansion tank. Again, this is the highest point in the radiator. Coolant will travel down this tube and into this tank. All the air will float to the top. And then if pressure builds up to the point where it pushes stuff out, air is going to be the first thing to go. There's also a return line on some systems that will send coolant back into the system from the tank. This area up here works exactly the same as the radiator cap design in that any pressure is vented off to the side after the cap seal is pushed up on and then this hose will lead elsewhere. That could lead to one of these tanks, it could just lead to atmosphere. Usually you don't see that kind of thing except for unless they've built the system where they know that they're not going to be venting liquid out very often or it's a race car and they just don't care or it's been modified and they just don't care. Having this vent to nothing is potentially very messy, so even some racetracks don't allow you to do that. You'll have a tank like this and it will capture any overflow. Sometimes it's not even designed to let overflow go back in. It's just there to catch it and you can pour it back in later, but either way it retains the liquid and you don't make a mess. Some of these may have sensors in them that let you know via the dashboard if your level is too low and that's electronic stuff. Aside from that thermostat heater that I showed you earlier, most of the sensors that are going to be on the cooling system are monitors to make sure everything's going okay. What's the temperature? What's the level? Control valves will use electricity to move valve that will direct fluid one place or another. A lot of times that's a heater control valve. I'm leaving out the thorough details of how these sensors work because it's better suited for an electronics video. I do get into those topics in other videos, but I wanted to make this video just about the cooling system and about like thermal and mechanical properties that make it work. Hopefully this video did a good job of explaining all the intricacies of a modern cooling system. If you have any questions or feel like I missed anything important, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next Car Simplified video.